Dante has a lot of moves. I mean, a lot. So many, in fact, that you could theoretically use a single different move for each floor of the Bloody Palace and still have moves left over by the end. So today, I've decided to answer a question that literally nobody has had. Can you beat the Bloody Palace by only using one move per floor? This challenge is a bit more specific than some of my previous ones, so I want to quickly go over the rules. Firstly, the Bloody Palace is a timed 101 floor gauntlet of enemies. The main rule of the challenge is that I'm limiting myself to a single move to clear an entire floor. After that floor, I can never use the same move again. An important note for this rule is that Dante has several swords that share a move set, but the moves are all listed out separately for each sword. As such, I allowed myself to use Rebellion, Sparta, and Dante's sword moves as separate entries in my list. Lastly, I also allowed things like Devil Trigger and Taunt to be used freely, which I'll touch on more in a little bit. So to tackle this challenge, I compiled a list. I wrote out every single one of Dante's moves and arbitrarily assigned them to different floors. I had moves left over so I was able to play around and exclude some that I deemed too slow or just bad, like Ebony Shot or Firework Air. I kept them on the back burner in case I wanted to swap others out, but from there, I just started doing runs. As I began the challenge in my early attempts, I assumed my main problem would be survival, but I was extremely wrong. Those were the days when I was so naive and innocent to what this challenge would ultimately put me through. I ran out of time on floor 8. Clearly, I had to change up my move list. These first three floors are a perfect example of Dante's three swords sharing a move set. On floor one, I used round trip with rebellion, floor two was round trip with Sparta, and floor three was round trips with devil sword Dante. Climbing the Bloody Palace, enemies get stronger after every 20 floors. By floor 80, they're considered Dante Must Die difficulty, which means they hit like a truck and take a lot less damage. My original plan when assigning moves was to front load the beginning with a lot of moves that on their own are not the most useful or powerful, so that I could save the strong and impactful moves for the late game when the enemies become a lot harder to kill. Once I failed on stage 8, I realized that I had to put some decent moves early on to give myself a time cushion, and I also started focusing on the no damage time bonus when clearing a floor without getting hit. Using my new rearranged list and placing more emphasis on the timer, I was able to get to around floor 45 before once again running out of time. I kept refining my list every time I got to a floor that felt like a slog, and I was doing my best to play carefully and not get hit, so why was I still failing? I still wasn't able to even breach the halfway point. There had to be something I was missing. As I was going through, refining my list, and testing different moves on different stages, I noticed something interesting. A lot of this? the stage bonus times I was seeing on the selection page were vastly larger than any amount of bonus time that I had been receiving during my tests. I did some testing and really focused on the amount of time that I was gaining, and I discovered exactly what it was that I had been overlooking. I was putting so much emphasis on not getting hit that I didn't realize what was truly affecting my bonus time. Style rank. On stage 10 here, each one of these small impusa add 1 second to my timer when killed. After getting an S rank though, they begin giving 3 seconds per kill. While this might not seem like much, each type of enemy has its own amount of time that it grants. The general rule is that the bigger the enemy, the more time it will give. Killing the impusa queen, for example, usually gives around 10-15 to 15 seconds with low style rank, but defeating it with an S rank gave me a whole 45 seconds. If I had a double or triple S rank, it would have given me upwards of a minute or more on the timer. And that was the final key to the run, I had to focus on style. Easy enough under normal circumstances, but using the same move over and over again gives extremely diminishing returns to style rank. That's where air taunts and devil trigger come in. Air taunt was the quickest and safest taunt to use, and a successful taunt would grant me a fair amount of style meter once every 20 seconds or so. 
Devil Trigger was another key feature in helping maintain my style. When Devil Triggered, Dante is passively followed by Phantom Blades. In Swordmaster, they'll slash in tandem with my normal attacks, and in Gunslinger, they will passively shoot out at any nearby enemies that I'm not locked onto. These extra slashes counted towards adding to my style rank, even if the move that I was using constantly by itself did not. Additionally, Devil Trigger allows for hits to be taken without getting staggered. As as a result, when I would get hit while well in Devil Trigger, I would not lose my style rank. All of these things combined allowed me to maintain a rank of A or even S on a lot of floors where it really mattered. This let me build up a ton of time early on that would help carry me through the later stages. 20 stages into the palace and it was time for the first boss, the Fire Giant. I chose Blaster Twins for this guy because he was easy to jump cancel off of and big enough that both shots from the rockets would hit him most of the time. My main goal was to beat him without getting hit because the no damage time bonus on boss fights is an extra minute, which was huge. I tried to be safe, but I got sucked into his vortex, which did damage, so no time bonus for me. I still managed to come out with extra time though, so the bonus minute wasn't a huge loss. A ton of stages throughout the run ended up losing me time, so I had to really capitalize on mitigating that time loss through style rank, and gaining as much time as I could on stages where I knew that I had the potential for it. On stages where Furies showed up, I tried to use moves that would let me easily parry them. So originally I had placed things like Ice Age and Prop Shredder here, but those turned out to be terrible picks. They would let me easily parry the Fury, yeah, but they would ultimately do very little damage because the Fury teleports away after it takes a certain number of hits regardless of the damage that each hit does. Shoutouts to my No Weapons Challenge run. Because of that run I learned a lot of royal guard timings for normal enemies, and this came in extremely handy here. Perfect royal guards will always give a huge boost to style rank. I tried to utilize this as much as I could, but I didn't lean on it too heavily because fishing for perfect guards can be a slippery slope that leads to a lot of time wasted. I dispersed powerful moves that would guaranteed one shot an entire stage throughout my list so that I knew I could pick up some extra time simply by making it to those floors. Stage 30 was another huge time gain if I could play my cards right. I picked Cavalier Combo B for this task because it's a three part multi hitting attack which was good for style building. Beyond that, using any cavalier moves comes with innate hyper armor even outside of devil trigger, so if I got hit during my combo, I wouldn't lose my style. Lastly, it was high damage and really good crowd control. The final part of the combo can be held indefinitely, so any poor enemy that got caught in it was just juggled until death. I spent almost two minutes on this stage, but because I was able to keep my style rank up so well, I got four and a half minutes of bonus time. Style, moves, and time all tying in together really shows just how important the move that I assigned to any given floor ended up being, and explains why I spent literal weeks testing and refining my list. I was able to take out weak flying enemies with generally slow ground moves, by having the passive swords from Devil Trigger shoot them out of the sky. This also helped prevent small green and Pusa enemies from healing others in a lot of situations. On certain floors, special red and Pusa would show up. My original plan was to simply ignore them, because they just run around and after a while they disappear, and I didn't believe it was worth wasting a move or my time on them. As I was going through trimming the fat from my list, all of the prop shredder moves ended up getting sidelined for other better better moves in their spot. Since they ended up being extra, I decided to see how they would do against these red Impusa, and they managed to really surprise me. On top of that, these Impusa give a ton of extra time for very little investment. Stage 40 was another boss, and this time around it was a mutated Silent Hill nurse. I used Aerial Rave with Rebellion for this fight because I could teleport right into Artemis' face and then jump cancel out of the combo at any point when she would do her AoE scream. The only other move I was worried about were her small apparatuses that fly around and shoot, but I managed to stay in her face enough that I could stagger her anytime she even tried to summon them. I got the no damage bonus in this fight, which was huge, because I only had 20 more floors and another boss left before my time started tanking. 
The great thing about Stinger is that when Devil Triggered, the move changes completely. It does a ton more damage and pierces enemies with a massive stagger potential to boot. Because of that, I used one Angelo to train the rest of the stage behind me, then I got into position and went to town. Then we had the awkward floors with moves that didn't quite fit in. I put Rainstorm here because the Impusa Queen was easy to jump cancel from, and I could get the most consistent hits on it. The Queen will damage other enemies whenever it slashes around, so my hope was that it would kill these two lizards here while I hammered bullets into its skull. Once it was down to just the Impusa Queen, I killed it with a double S rank and it gave me over a minute by itself, and I actually went positive on this floor. High time against a Fury was not the smartest idea. The issue with Dante's Helmbreaker moves is that against most enemies, they'll get knocked away after one or two strikes. I tried to put these moves on floors with bigger enemies so that I could repeatedly jump in place and slash down to maximize DPS. These nobodies were perfect for that, because while they did get knocked back after a few slashes, once they were knocked down, they stayed right there and let me keep wailing on them. Stages like this were some of my favorites because they gave me a brief moment to relax and turn my brain off, where I didn't have to focus like I did on most of the other floors. My philosophy for stage 50 was to maintain some semblance of a style rank, but mostly just let the enemies kill each other and then mop up. Same thing with stage 54. I'm getting a little ahead of myself though. On floor 53, Three, we have these scissor enemies, and typically the best way to deal with them is to parry them and expose their weak point, and then they'll die in one hit. But I think this is more fun. Get good at Devil May Cry with this one simple trick. You won't believe it. 4 out of 5 Proto Angelos recommend acetaminophen to deal with splitting headaches. Check with your doctor to see if it's right for you. Ah, Cavalier Angelo. Unfortunately, I don't have a witty comparison for him. I'm not sure if it's quicker to fully build up the royal meter and then do a max release, or just royal release every single one of his attacks, so I ended up doing a mix of both. I took an unfortunate hit to this stray lightning bolt towards the end of the fight, but regardless I was still moving on with over 20 minutes to my name. Greg started using this one simple trick and got good at Devil May Cry virtually overnight. What do you have to say about that, Greg? Oh, I, I started using this trick and I used to only play on human mode, but before I knew it I was, I was a real full-fledged devil hunter. And then a bunch of furies. Furi? Showed up to eat Dante's lunch. Using Aerial Rave slightly above the ground was really good in this fight because it would often parry whenever the Furies were attacking. If spamming the move didn't parry, it was likely that they would miss and get hit by the swings regardless. While this stage might seem scary on paper, in practice it was just a simple rinse and repeat. On 73, Dante decided to make himself really dizzy. 75 was a stage that had a potential bonus time of around 5 minutes. This is a great example of what happened when I would get unfortunately hit and lose all of my style rank. I got a minute 18 for my bonus time and overall I lost 15 seconds. All I had to do at this point was maintain though. If I could hover around this amount of time into the 80s and 90s, I'd be golden. Light Blow was able to stunlock the two Judecas on 79 so that they couldn't spawn any enemies, and the Proto Angelo just kinda stood there and watched? And then I beat him up too. Quelag came busting in through the ceiling, but luckily the bird chicken thing was really weak to being run over. 130 horsepower was more than enough to keep her on the ground for the majority of the fight. Dante's ability to spin the wheel meant that as soon as she tried to get up, the chicken monstrosity would just fall right back down. As soon as she entered her regeneration phase, it was all over and I scored myself another no damage bonus. It was time for the real party now. All remaining floors are considered dominant. Dante must die difficulty, and if I wasn't careful, enemies could easily devil trigger and end up costing me multiple minutes per stage. Not to mention the sheer amount of damage some enemies could output now, a couple of bad hits could spell my doom. On my way to the top, I noticed some heads in need of hats, and like any good citizen, I was happy to provide. 83 is one of the more dangerous stages, so I tried to stay in the air as much as possible and I used a move that could easily juggle these lizards. By this point, I was hemorrhaging minutes per stage, so I really had to go try hard for this next little bit. Mm. 
Nope. Stage 85 gave me flashbacks to my DMC3 Bloody Palace days. Proto Angelos are one of the biggest time wasters at this point, and because of this guy I lost another two and a half minutes. But that was the least of my problems. I was well over three hours into this run, and tragedy was about to strike. I picked Demolition to instantly eliminate both Furies on the next floor, and in all my practice attempts, the Sin Devil Trigger Activation Blast knocked them both down. This time, it didn't. I killed one easily, but I was panicked. I started spamming the button. There were several times where I would have had the Fury, but I kept spamming instead of holding it. And just like that, my Sin Devil Trigger was gone. I sat and thought about what had just happened and I was devastated. But ultimately, I decided to push forward with the run. I had come so far. I went back and made sure that I did it right, but a stage that should have given me a minute ended up costing me 20 seconds instead. King Cerberus was the boss of stage 90. Overdrive was the most effective move that I could find for this guy because it can pierce and I could keep my distance to avoid being hit. I was able to perform a quick drive by attacking once and inputting the forward to back motion with another attack input. I used this to take quick hits when I felt it wasn't safe enough to fully charge and overdrive up. And the lightning phase was the easiest because a majority of his projectiles would get destroyed by the drive shots and still hit him as well. I timed my devil trigger for when I would get fully charged overdrives off to deal massive damage until I sent the doggo back to hell. I squeezed the last few seconds I could get out of floor 91 and then it was a sprint to the finish. I paid 2 minutes and 45 seconds to use Cerberus Combo A. It's possible here to parry 4 of these scissors as they spawn and only deal with 1, but I somehow managed the opposite scenario. It was extremely dangerous to use a move with as much commitment as Cascade this late into the game, but it was the best one for the job out of the moves that I had left to work with. I thought that I could keep all of these enemies knocked down with a single shot, but the devil triggered Lizard had other plans. I almost died and I was certain the lizard was gonna kill me here, but I told him he was in my personal space and he kindly backed up. I lost two minutes, but I didn't lose my life. 96 was a lot easier because I had access to Stinger the best move in the game. So basically, I was unstoppable. Stage 97 was my last concern. Boss stages add time up front, so if I could clear this one with even a second left on the timer, I would be in the money. I went with safety over speed and picked blaster as my move. I needed to kill one enemy to spawn the key to finishing this floor, the big guy. This behemoth does friendly fire. So while I stayed safe in the skies, he took out my enemies for me, including another fury. It wasn't fast, but when the dust settled, I still had five minutes to my name. Time was no longer an issue. All that was left was one final boss gauntlet, and I saved the best moves for last. Magic Hat summons a small friend that shoots for me, so all I had to do was run around and he shot out the crystal, and then it was on to the next stage. Man in the Red works really well here because of how the crystals attempt to block damage to Urizen. All I had to do was stand in front of him, and the crystal broke within seconds. This was another move that dealt passive damage, so I could just focus on dodging Urizen's attacks, and then stand way too close to him to damage him. This version of Urizen loves to stand around, so I decided to do the same. The longer I could hold red shot, the faster it would deal damage, so I just let him have it. I actually had to play the game a small amount when I got to third phase, but it still wasn't even a competition. By the end, he tried to intimidate me to stop shooting by walking slowly towards me, but it didn't work. Last but not least, Virgil. A fully charged red hot knight would take Virgil out in one shot. All I had to do was charge it up, and that would be that. As I was about to rain hellfire down upon him, he dodged. Okay, no problem. I'll just do it again. This time, I'll get him for sure. Nope. I tried again and again, but every time, he either hit me out of it, or dodged at the last possible second. Then, as I was charging one more time, something terrible happened. My fingers slipped, I tried to pause buffer to re-grab the input before it registered, but it was too late. I let loose a single charge of Red Hot Knight. Now missing some health, Virgil became more aggressive and made my windows of opportunity even smaller. 
I managed to get another single charge off while he was devil triggered, but this wasn't looking good. I had to kill him before the doppelganger came out. Just as I was about to land the killing blow, he stopped me again at the last possible second, and then he summoned the doppelganger. I ran around for several minutes looking for any kind of opening to use this move, but I found none. When Virgil wasn't attacking, his doppelganger was. One stayed close while the other struck from afar. Between both of their summoned swords, judgment cuts, teleports, and relentless pressure, I didn't see a way out. I came to the conclusion that it was no longer possible for me to use this move, and I made the executive decision to break my rule. I used a second move. I wanted to complete the run, so I entered Sin Devil Trigger and used the loose to finish Virgil off before he healed beyond even that possibility. To keep the spirit of the run intact, I went back and I completed the fight the right way. Virgil decided to cooperate and didn't pull out another clutch teleport, and the fight was over before it even really started. So, can you beat the Bloody Palace if you only use one move per floor? Yes. With enough perseverance and footwork, you can absolutely carry enough time to the end in order to complete the run. That being said, there were a couple of blemishes on my run, so I pose this to anybody watching. If you want to attempt this challenge, you could absolutely do it better than I did. You could be the person to get that flawless single segment run. If you think you're crazy enough to try this challenge, I have a link in the description to the Google Doc that lists out every single move that I assign to every floor, and I hope that helps in your attempts. Either way, that's all from me. Thank you all so much for watching. Please consider subscribing if you enjoyed, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.